When we made this movie, no one had made a movie like The Mask. Hello! From the story to the characters, excitement in the color. Tuttle! Gangsters, oh, romance, oh. musical numbers. Wolf whistling at the girl and the eyes bulging out. How could you not have fun? Such a wild character. He's the guy that everybody would love to be when you know, somebody's going, you got a problem, man? No one had ever done these sort of effects. It's so explosive. And it's so funny. Pardon me. Where anything can happen. It originated as a comic book, and it was by Dark Horse. The comic book, though, was radically different than what the film turned out to be. Well, the comic book initially was a concept I had years before I started the uh, comic itself. The comic was very dark, a lot of humor. And it was edgy and a kind of extreme cool style to it that I thought was really attractive. But it was quite frightening. The character would put the mask on and chop people up and then have a joke or two. And there's a large body count. It was vindication. It was revenge. There was that screw you, boss, I'm coming back at you attitude that the mask had. But of course, we were familiar with that and had embraced it with Freddy Krueger. Mike DeLuca fell in love with it. He was the guy who really pushed this project forward. They were primarily interested in making a horror film with probably a sense of humor to it. They wanted to be true to the comic, and the original comic was very much in line with what New Line had made in the past. Come to Freddy. They really were looking for a fresh Elm Street series, basically. I was literally thinking about looking into the, into the rights very shortly myself, and I got a call from New Line. Well, I always thought Chuck would be a great director for this project. He also uh, done one of our most successful Nightmare on Elm Streets that Chuck and Frank Darabont had, had written the script for and then Chuck directed. Have a seat. Ultimately, it was more successful financially than the first two put together. So there was a trust that was developed between uh, Bob Shea and myself and that I'd taken his prized franchise and given it a new life. This is it, Jennifer. You're big, bright, and TV. Chuck had the right sensibility for a mask because he understood effects at that point. He had a strong base in horror, which is where this project started out. And I think the first more horrific script uh, let them down a little bit. There were several different writers and several different drafts, but none of them really caught that synthesis of playful nastiness and comeuppance, so to speak. Originally, when I looked at the material, I really kept getting stuck because as they were horrific, that this was such a fun idea that a really scary take on the mask seemed to be a letdown to me. And I, I slowly realized that this would be a much better comedy and a very explosive comedy. Snooze. And he had a, a, a very exciting take, I thought. It's rare in Hollywood uh, that a studio really lets you turn an idea around and do something as original as The Mask. But they let me run with it. Sorry, wrong pocket. Chuck was the visionary for this film. And uh, the more we talked, the more we realized how much in sync we were on this. You know, I really knew what I wanted to do, and I realized a lot of it was influenced by Tex Avery. He's known for being, I guess, the strangest animator who achieved popularity. He was running the edge between comedy and kind of grotesque things that would surprise you almost to the point where they were a bit scary, but they were so inventive and brilliant. His idea to sort of fuse those things into one film was really solid for me. And Mike and I sat at my house and worked things out on a scene-by-scene -scene basis, and uh, he went and wrote our draft of the screenplay. What I realized right away with the basic story of The Mask, while it's a fun movie, uh, I take the themes very seriously. You know, what is that animal inside each person? I think that kind of idea makes us each ask, you know, what's inside of me? What would be unleashed? What's the darker, or crazier side? This is a terrifically resonant theme that's been in storytelling forever. My first knowledge of it was Jekyll and Hyde. That's the classic tale. 
It's a prevalent story because it's true. There's a side to human nature we can't quite explain, that dark side or that uncontrollable side. With these powers, I could be... a superhero! Most people, their public persona is very different from who they really think they are in their hearts. P-A-R-T. Why? Because I gotta! And the really great comedic version of this that had been done previously was The Nutty Professor. Uh, and in, in our case, I thought it was taking the idea a step further in this kind of surreal world. <gasps> Hello, Sherry. Où est mes taguets? I made sure there was an internal logic in the story. While all the rules of the mask aren't clear, in fact, it's kind of fun for the audience to discover them, uh, we had to know, and I had to know, exactly what I felt it could and could not do. How does it work? I don't know. Whatever you were truly deep down inside, you would become that when you put on the mask. Somebody stop me! It changes you into the alter ego, you know, the, to, the, to the suppressed side of your personality. It blows that side up like a thousand times. And, uh, all right, bring it in! In the case of Stanley Imkiss, Stanley's worst side is a joyful prankster. He's ultimately such a good-hearted guy, it's a fun rampage. Tell Scarlet I do give it him. He becomes this love-crazed, wild, Fred Astaire character that's just unstoppable. He becomes everything he isn't, but everything he wants to be. That's gotta hurt. Oh. The third yeah. thing, taking my cue from uh, vampire movies, I imposed a rule that the mask would only work at night. <laughs> Very early on in the process, Chuck told me to write this film for someone named Jim Carrey. And I remember quite distinctly saying, who? Me? Oh, I'm great. Really good. At that time, Jim was uh, not well known. Like a lot of people, I first noticed Jim Carrey on the TV show In Living Color. And I just thought it was the funniest human being on the planet. I'd never seen anything like it. Stanley Ipkiss is so much based on Jim Carrey. I mean, this was really redeveloped for Jim because I just had a hunch. I was convinced he'd be uh, a terrific lead, and I went on this little kind of Jim Carrey quest. And I'm pretty sure Chuck said, well, I'm not making the movie unless we can get him to star in it. When I saw the stand-up show that Jim Carrey had done, I mean, I was floored. I thought this guy was fantastic, and he was absolutely perfect for the mask. When I met him, I said to him, if you trust me, we'll do a much more subtle kind of romantic comedy. And then when you put the mask on, we'll push the envelope on what you've done on the Wilder side. And, and those are both so true to Jim. So that sweet, soft-spoken Jim Carrey exists, and the edgy, mm -hmm. crazy Jim Carrey exists. Just facets of the same true human being. You were good, kid, real good. But as long as I'm around, you'll always be second best, see? When he read the screenplay in our first meeting, after he read that, uh, he said, it's like it's written for me. And I said, you know, it is. It, it has been written for you. I hope you say yes, because I'm in trouble if you don't. New Line was okay with Jim Carrey, but Jim Carrey at that time was not a coup. He was a, a bit of a risk. This is a moment of truth. When a man shows what he's really made of. Crap. Ace Ventura had not come out, so no one really knew how popular Jim would be. The reason why we hired Jim was that we needed someone who could handle the physicality of the role. And Jim was always the obvious choice. The more problematic concern, which was who was going to play the love interest. That was the hardest and toughest casting. But I always envisioned her as some incredibly voluptuous girl. I conceived of this kind of Marilyn Monroe entrance for this girl. So right from the top, I wanted her to be a real femme fatale. They went out to many big actresses, but you were really saying, do you want to star in a movie with a TV actor, with a director who had done a horror movie? And everyone turned us down. Thanks. Because this was a low-budget film. We weren't going to get the leading ladies of the day. And so I felt I'd be much better off with somebody brand new. At one point in the casting, we did take Anna Nicole Smith very seriously. And this was at the very beginning of her career when she looked her best and she was the sharpest. She really looked what I thought the part uh, called for. And then we actually talked about the possibility of an African-American actress. Chuck went very hard after Vanessa Williams. And we were getting closer to shooting, so it was getting a little tense. And we opened it up to wide calls. And we just had a lot of eight by 10 sitting around. He would not cast that part until he re found the right person, and then he did. Right away in her look, even in her 8x10, there was something especially charming and unusual about this girl. 
And it seemed to go with this whole kind of 40s edge city thing. Cameron Diaz was immediately the choice I was most excited about. I knew it was in trouble because she had no acting background at that point. Tina Carlisle, pleased to meet you. The pleasure's all mine. At the end of the day, Chuck, just as he did with Jim Carrey, who was not a household name, he chose Cameron because he thought that she and Jim were, were a perfect counterpoint. The chemistry between her and Jim when I read them together was uh, just terrific. They were my, my leads. I guess I'll get going. Yeah, but Miss Annie Ray, you know, just, um, just stay for a second, you know? I literally put my job on the line and I said, this is our star. You're going to thank me for this later. This is somebody special. Chuck is an experienced producer, and so he's no dummy about what's required for a production, and so I trusted him. And this was a huge gamble. This was the largest budgeted film New Line had ever made. This was their first film that was really kind of a mainstream sort of film with big visual effects. And we really went to ILM because we needed something recognizable on the marquee that would say that this is a legitimate mainstream sort of movie. We were going to use technology that had to be developed, but what New Line has always been great at is taking risks and taking gambles. Oh, every movie is a risk. It's a question of what gets your blood rushing and gets your temperature up, and this picture definitely did. Hey, Mark. <laughs> All right, pay attention and follow him with your guys. Playback. Jim! All right, let's see playback real quick. While every film is tough and the hours are long and I don't think people have any idea, still within that space, I've got to make sure that we enjoy ourselves or I don't believe the audiences will in this kind of movie. Oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> I think in comedy, one of the director's jobs is to create kind of a bubble around the set where we can be, literally be playful. Chuck was very supportive of Jim. He was very much giving Jim a lot of freedom and then stepping in where he felt he needed to. But he was very good on allowing Jim to really be Jim and really express himself. I knew Jim would be great with improvisation, so I wanted to make sure I left room for that. That ability to fly with a good idea was something I wanted to build in. A giraffe! There you go, son. Now get out of here, by the way. That was Jim's strength, and that's really where a lot of the great magic came from. <laughs> The best single improvisation Jim did on the show was because a special effect broke down. There's this scene where he becomes a Frenchman. Kiss me, my dear, and I will reveal my croissant. And he was meant to do this crazy gag with lighting cigarettes. The property people had this big thing of cigarettes that Jim was supposed to light and, and inhale, and they would instantly be sucked down to ash. Cigarette? and it didn't really work at all. And Jim said to me, what if... And it was, it's one of the funnier, more natural bits in the film. So Jim actually did improvise one of the opticals. Like Napoleon, I will divide and conquer. I don't think anybody else could have, could have done this. I mean, there is something that is so unique about his personality, his physical abilities, and his talent. What he did physically on the mask is very, very strenuous and takes somebody special. He would throw himself into it, body and soul. One thing about him is his energy. We work long hours on the mask. You know, when you get to about the 12th hour, everybody gets tired. And we used to have this expression where we say we were, we were hitting the wall. And I'll be damned, Jim would just then easily kick his energy level up two or three more notches and just keep the whole crew going. Then Cameron came on and wow, whoever thought that, I think she was 19 at the time, that she could keep up with Jim Carrey and boy did she. Her first day of dialogue, I think we were both just a little concerned, but we got the scene, I looked at the dailies and she was wonderful. Right away you can see we'd made a great choice. And when he snaps, I wanted to be like a kiss like you never had to be okay. Okay. I wanted to be dazed. Okay. But really, she was the girl you see. She is that fun. Cameron will tell you she had a great time on the set, even though she had this responsibility, and she eventually, you know, relaxed with that. One of the things that was really a leap from the original comic book was Milo the dog. My friends have a Jack Russell Terrier named Milo who's crazy. I gonna throw it with you attached to it. Oh. It just was a big epiphany. That's it. Stanley has a Jack Russell Terror named Milo, who's his best friend. You stay here and be a good boy. 
Daddy's gonna have to go kick some ass. It was casting I took as serious as uh, my other lead performers. <laughs> I had auditions, which the producers thought were crazy. A dog does go through an audition just the same way that an actor does. A lot of times you go in, uh, meet the director, but each project is different. We happened to have a Jack Russell at that time, so it just worked. Smart dog. The dog was really one of the strengths of this movie. So we made sure we shot this dog correctly. We took the time. He always hit Go his mark, him. and he Go always him. came through. Go get him. That's it? Yeah. One of Max's best moments in the film is probably the cheese keys no. gags in the jail. No, the cheese, the keys. That was a really neat sequence. and and. You look for little pieces that really make things work. Particularly this one moment I love where you just see the dog kind of checking to make sure the cop is still sleeping. That is a very human moment for a dog. We had the guard stir just a little bit, and he froze. And if you look closely there, his eyes look up at him, and then as he settles back down, he goes back down, grabs the keys, and takes off. Yeah. That particular sequence, we shot that first, and then Jim Carrey came in, watched the sequence, and responded to it. Put the cheese down, and get the keys. Go on. Over there. Max Over there. and Jim were both wonderful at improv. Uh, the one I like the best is where Jim is at the window of the yeah. jail. Get up there. Get up here. Get up here. That's it. The dog kept jumping and jumping, and Jim kept, in character, <laughs> uh, responding to him. I just kept the cameras rolling. Put some effort into it. The other one is when Jim has the frisbee, and Max is hanging on to it. No, no, no. Stop it. Max just hung on. It was very, very funny. Ipkiss, get your dog away from me. I'm sorry he seems to be attracted to you. In the comic book, you don't really have a sense of place. And I had this concept for a place called Edge City, which is a little based on our world, of course, but it, it, in kind of a time that seems to be somewhere between the 40s and 60s and the present, sort of all mixed up in a world that would be a little funnier, a little crazier. And that, to me, is Edge City. The methane emissions really pick up the colors. The look of this movie was very interesting. There are two key players in it. One was our production designer, Craig Stearns, and the other was the cameraman, John Leonetti. And we wanted to give it an exciting, interesting look that would be comic booky, but also look realistic. I wanted it to be bigger than life and richer than life and more colorful than life. <laughs> so I thought it was a great opportunity to really have these rich, magical colors throughout the film, especially with this green, vibrant face. The expression of the story visually in comic books is very much with color. And I thought that it would be really fun to be able to push the limits of colors in this film and make it a live action, vivid comic. A French poodle. Sorry, son, the dog was rabbit, had to put it down. But making it believable that Edge City exists was kind of the, the challenge to me. In the day, it's kind of a dreary, kind of gnarly city, if you will. But Edge City at night really comes alive. We created the nightclub, and we really wanted to create a feel of a place that would be fun, that would look different, but also have retro feel. Let's rock this joint! The dance scenes were quite amazing. It really had to be choreographed, but yet we allowed for a lot of improvisation at the same time. Fortunately, we were able to get the rehearsal time, and we worked up those dances almost like improv comedy, where we found out what both kids were capable of doing, and I worked out exactly where it was gonna go into optical, because I wanted to do something that was wild and different there, too. It was just a hard time explaining that to New Line. Hit it! I had uh, some reservations about the big dance number, which Chuck was adamant about. He just insisted on it, and I thought it was gonna, it was gonna be over the top. But of course, I didn't know what a superstar Jim really was. Smoke him! Jim was able to do a lot of things that we never thought he could do, which saved us on computer graphics. The most tricky thing about visual effects at that point was interactivity, was where the people really interact with the visual effects, and that's what this movie was about. A Tommy gun! 
I remember at the time Chuck saying, well, the effects are going to be very expensive for this film, but we're going to save a lot of money with Jim because Jim can stretch his face, and so ILM has a little less work to do. He is a rubber man. There's nobody that's more rubbery naturally, I think, than him, and, you know, what a perfect match for the mask. I was looking at what this guy was doing with his body, and I had just never seen anything like it. And I knew with Jim, he'd meet me halfway with what he could do in a performance. And that blend is, I think, a big part of what makes the visuals in the mask successful. So in fact, we actually scrapped some shots when we were shooting them because Jim already looked like he was stretching. There was no reason to help it along with an optical effect. The beauty of these effects in this movie is that they didn't overpower Jim. You can't put the optical on top of the actor. The actor and the optical have to really be working together. <laughs> One of the things that I think is unheralded a little bit from the mask is the job Greg Canham did on the makeup. One of the things that I knew was going to be really tough was how to make this makeup effect so versatile that the performance could come through and, and maybe even be enhanced by it. Because I was going to take a performer whose best asset was this extremely Frankly, mobile face. This guy's incorrigible. I covered him completely in rubber which could be a disaster. We could have done it much cheaper with just like a green rubber mask, but then you would never get Jim coming maybe. through. The mask work was done off of Jim's bony structures, so cheekbone, forehead, chin, and everything else was such a thin prosthetic that you got every expression and eyebrow movement and everything that Jim Carrey normally does. And uh, I thought it worked great, blended right in with the opticals. <laughs> When we made this movie, no one had done the type of effects that you see in the mask. We were just getting into the digital phase where CG had become a legitimate tool. The state of special effects way back in 94. Uh, really, it was close to the dawn of the digital age of computer animation as we know it today. And really, we were entering new territory. So that's why we went to a company like ILM. They were the, the groundbreaking house. They still are terrific. They had done the Star Wars, the Indiana Jones movies. They were just superstars. effects over the years have evolved so much. And I think it showed the world that visual effects blending with live action was going to be a lot easier to pull off. And creatively, just a better tool. People didn't ask about the opticals specifically until later. I think they sort of accepted the opticals as part of the film. And that was my goal. And my goal is not to let the opticals run away with the story, but to make them part of the story. The original ending of the film, Charlie jumps into the river and gets the mask, and it just didn't test well, I mean, nobody cared. They wanted the dog to have the mask, and so we had to reshoot that scene. Marlo! We brought the film in a not complete state to Cannes, and after the screening, the audience was ecstatic. They really went crazy. They knew they had a terrific film, we also had Ace Ventura open a few months before us, which had done well. It was a great ad campaign. I remember when the, the movie was about to come out, that trailer was playing everywhere, and people really were responding to it. Jim Carrey is... That's the guy! Hello! The Mask. When the film was finally released, there was such an explosive reaction because no one had any expectations. No one knew what to think of this film called The Mask. Hold on to your lug nuts! It's time! People, I think, were blown away. I just think people had a really good time. So, you know, I was quite happy with the reception of the film, and it made an amazing amount of money for a small film. For New Line, The Mask was one of its most successful films when it came out. It had a giant opening weekend, and it became an instant success. And Jim was really acknowledged and deserved it. You, know. you love me. You really love me. Well, I think it played a signal role in his career, but I, if it wasn't The Mask, it would have been something else because the guy is such a signal talent. After The Mask, Jim went into Dumb and Dumber, and, and, and it's hysterical. I mean, to, that's hey. another side of Jim. I guess they're right. Senior citizens, although slow and dangerous behind the wheel, can still serve a purpose. I think they took that kind of charming simpleton and uh, really made it work in that film. Austria! <laughs> 
Well then, <laughs> good day, mate. <laughs> Cameron got so much attention as a brand new leading lady. I think she did something very wise. Rather than go out and do a lot of big commercial films, she did some really interesting films. And I think showed people right away that she's versatile. And I think that now she has this great prevalent career. She has really demonstrated herself to be a very good actress with a very nice range. She became a superstar. <laughs> After the success of The Mask, we talked about sequels. I think there's more stories that can be told with The Mask. The great thing about the comic and about the movie, anyone can get The Mask. So while Stanley Ipkiss' story may play out, uh, someone else can get The Mask and start a whole different storyline. <laughs> Time will be good to The Mask. I still talk to people who tell me how much they love that movie and now they think it's a real classic. I still believe in the story of The Mask. There was a lot of passion put into this little film and I think it adds to the fun and excitement of the show. It's one of those good risks I think that you need to take sometimes in life. Smoking! Tina Carlisle. The amazing thing about Cameron Diaz is that the story of her getting the role in The Mask is an all-time great Hollywood history story. Hello, Stanley. It's up there with the Lana Turner getting discovered at Schwab's, but it's better because it's true. It's few and far between that a jewel walks in. She had it. But all I wanted was a kiss. We were all ready for Cameron to be a star. Everyone loves Cameron Diaz. I remember reading the script of The Mask and thinking, we have to do this movie. It's Tina Carlisle is the classic mystery girl. So I wanted a girl who was brand new. I, I know I like that when I'm in an audience. I wanted her to be a real femme fatale who ultimately could be nothing but trouble for our lead man or become the true love interest. She was this voluptuous blonde bombshell. Tina was vampy. She was a sexy, Fun, lady, and a winner. She's the mall of this gangster. But had a heart. As you read it, you realize that the audience has to like her. But I didn't see the likability on the page. I just it believed that she had to have a heart. So I wanted to find that. Chuck said to us, the person who gets this role may have little or no experience at all. So you have to read Every actress, model, anyone who you think looks appropriate for the role. Get right up here! Don't be shy! You're like, there's no way that New Line is going to approve an unknown person for this role because it's just so huge. This is impossible. I didn't really feel like we had great choices, and we were getting closer to shooting, so it was getting a little tense. Anytime you're venturing out as a casting director to really find the unknown and be successful at it, it's questionable of how long a process it does take. It can take a minute, 
or it can take forever, and you still never find it. I would look in magazines. We didn't, wasn't even sure if they could speak English, and we were calling them in, and then they would walk in, and not a word was spoken. Shoot the window. I don't care. There were many women that came in. I would say hundreds, literally hundreds. Do you have no idea how many ways someone can hold a tie and say it looks like a Rorschach test? I'm telling you, I've seen hundreds of ways. Chuck had been on the phone with us saying, I'm not seeing enough people. There were late nights of just calling everyone in the world. Is there anyone that came into town? Is there someone? It truly, honestly, it got to that point that he didn't know what you were going to do. Will there ever be someone? My life is wrecked. Wrecked. Then, this is the odd thing, an agent named Robin Levy worked at Elite Modeling, and she was in the same building, and she would like take a shortcut through our office. I think it was Fern who grabbed Robin and said, Robin, do you know, is there anybody? I don't care if they have no experience. She said, there is one girl. She said she's really not interested in it, but you know, she's expressed a little bit about acting, and uh, you know, she's got a great personality, you should meet her. She's here now, and um, why don't I send her down? Personality, yeah. Personality, great. Hold the phone, kill her at three o'clock. Enter Cameron. There are all the people that can walk into a room. That word magic, there's just something. Cameron had it. My first impression is that I liked her. She walked into the door and, and one of the first things she said to me was, I don't know why I'm here, I, I'm really not sure. Okay, fine, I'll try this. I'm going, yeah, this is gonna be fun. <laughs> the first reading that uh, Cameron gave Maybe even before she opened up her mouth, I prayed. And we read this scene, and I said, oh, that's, that's really good. As I was saying about that tie, it reminds me of uh, one of those, what do you call it, uh, ink blot tests. Cameron had nothing to lose. So she wasn't walking in with, oh my God, this is the chance of a lifetime. It was like everything else Cameron was doing and that she was enjoying it. And that was Tina. And that's Cameron. I'm sorry, I never get personal in front of the help. I got very excited. I looked at my partner. I went, is it me? Are we exhausted? Did we hit something here? And we said, yeah, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> you know, you get giddy like a kid. That's when we said, are you going anywhere? Can you come back and meet our director? She said, well, I think I'm, d I'm just fine with this. And I'm... I'm going to Paris tomorrow anyway, so I think this is probably just fine. She is so coy. And I'm thinking to myself, I've never heard an actor turn down a lead role, and I don't think I have since. After she had left, I remember talking to Fern and saying, this is frustrating. She's actually good, and she's leaving town. And Fern was like, tell her to put on a cocktail dress and come back right now. Pick her out something pretty to wear, okay? As far as I was concerned, but this was it. She came back. I was surprised, but she came back in this little cocktail dress. And we worked on it and worked on it and worked on it until she felt really comfortable. And Chuck was in the other room setting up the camera. Once she was comfortable, we went in and we did it. From the first time I met Cameron, she was not a shy girl. Uh, she had a lot of guts. And she had this charm and this humor. And that giggle and that smile of hers was the selling point. Your girlfriend got a great review. This is somebody both men and women can like. I mean, that's, in, in a way, the definition of a real film star. And afterward, she left. And I remember saying to her, I said, you know, have a good trip. And, you know, by the way, if this is something you're really interested in, you're good. I mean, you should probably consider it. She was like, ah. Oh. Okay, I don't really care. <laughs> I just really care. She went away. She went to Paris, I think. Hello, Shelley. And we were auditioning people for a month. And then Chuck said to me, the one that stands out in my mind is that sweet girl. What about that girl that you brought in that time? Where is she? Is she around? Can we read her again? You think she'll ever come back, Charlie? Chuck says, call her back. Call her back from Paris? My casting directors told me that uh, she would have to fly back for this audition, and we weren't guaranteeing her the part. And I said, you know, of course we're not guaranteeing her the part, but it's a lead in a movie that's going to be terrific. How do you call someone 
and say, can you have her fly back from Paris for a callback? Just tell her she should fly back. And, you know, I really want to see her, and there's a real good reason to do it. And I think it was almost, you know, 24 hours later, Cameron was back. Hi. So I'm thinking to myself, maybe she does care just a little. <laughs> and she came in and read for Chuck, and the Cameron Diaz began to emerge. I was concerned that she hadn't done any acting at all before. I love using new people, but I'm also wise about new people, too, and I have to make sure she can be consistent. It's my job to be responsible, ultimately, to the film itself and to the company. I've got to make sure that it's not just a good day when it's a new actor or actress that doesn't have the craft. It's whether or not I can actually get that performance every day on the set. I had to put her through a number of readings because she was so new, it was very unusual to take somebody with no experience at a film at any level and give them a leading role. But it was all the other stuff that she had to be able to have. And I said to Cameron, you're going to do me a major favor. You don't have to. I said, but I want you to learn how to dance. I want you to learn how to sing. And we got her into dancing. She worked her tush off. Because again, she had nothing to lose either. She was along for the ride. Practically gave her a nervous breakdown through that much work. At one point, actually, Jim came to me and told me, look, she is great, and I'll do everything I can to help her. And I think that that's where Chuck got his resolve, because he knew that there was confidence from the leading man that there was going to be something that worked there. In fact, I taped half the movie with her and Jim at that point to prove to the studio this was the girl. They were very skeptical. Those methane emissions really pick up the colors. All those pinks and greens. The ultimate decision in casting Cameron in the role was Bob Shea. I remember walking into Mr. Shea's office, and we had the tape. Chuck was sitting down, and we put the tape in, and I'm standing by the doorway, and I hear Bob Shea say, are you out of your mind? I thought she was adorable, but as far as Cameron was concerned, the script really called for a very voluptuous uh, va-va-voom kind of girl. I just didn't think that she had the physical, the way it was written in the script. And I don't think she'd done any movies. Chuck wanted his way. I literally put my job on the line and I said, this is our star. You're going to thank me for this later. Uh, this is somebody special. Mike DeLuca, Chuck Russell and I were sitting there and Chuck was just, let me hire Cameron. And Mike DeLuca finally said, okay, you can hire her. Finally, we got an approval. Let's rock this joint! That night, we all celebrated at Dre's. It's party time! We all said, hey, you worked your tush off. You deserve it. Have a good time. And I think at the end of the day, Bob saw the qualities but just needed some physicality. Much like Howard Hughes, I got a hold of the costume designer and, and made them design some really radical push-up things to uh, give us uh, as much cleavage as this, this sweet little girl could muster. Everybody was just on her side, so this was an enormous family for her. I wanted to be like a kiss like you never had to be okay. Okay. I wanted to be dead. That set was a blast. It was fun, it was a little anarchic, and Jim Carrey was a blast. Is it fate? Is it meant to be? Is it written in the stars? Cameron was just a movie star going out. I mean, the, the public loved her. Everybody wanted to see that kiss at the end, which is not easy to do. It's not every movie you really want to see them kiss at the end, truly. Smoking! And here we'd achieved that between these two people, I could tell in the audiences. I really knew she was going to be a big star. It's one of those interesting, fun things in my job is that you can see it coming sometime. It's you all along. Cameron becoming a star, not necessarily was overnight. It took more like a week. I believe that both she and representation felt that she should take little mini steps. Her brains took priority and said, let me crawl before I walk. So I think it was very smart of her to do the little indies. She has learned her craft. Thanks. She was a gal that appreciated people and was like a sponge and absorbed off of good talent and had it in her. You look at those tapes now and you still see what's special about her. What you see to this day is exactly what we saw when, when Cameron walked in. There was everything of life to her. She just wanted to live it.
Tex Avery is a wonderful, ingenious cartoonist. To characterize his style, it's abrasive, no! fast paced. He's very non PC. <laughs> they were always scary and sexy and wilder than anything that I was seeing at the time. Absolutely insane. The imagery was so out. He went the farthest anybody has ever gone. I just fell in love with those things. Ew. He wanted to make you laugh, and that was it. Tex Avery was really the icon for the movie. This is what can be unleashed from Stanley Ipkiss. It would be perfect. I really thought, you know, how far can I take this? After Walt Disney, he is considered the main influence on studio Hollywood cartoons. He was the guy. He was the original. He was the one who really started making cartoons in this insane, crazy, funny way. He was really the first seriously hardworking humorist in animation. Tex Avery and his cohorts at Warner Brothers are really in the great tradition of the silent movie clowns. They're really taking what Keaton, Chaplin, and Laurel and Hardy did and taking it to another level. He tried to do things that you couldn't do with live action, and he certainly did. When Avery has his characters do a double take or a triple take or something, he doesn't just have them stretch a little bit. I mean, he goes to extreme extremes. The body flies completely apart. I would say that his work is very, very fast. Things happen almost before you realize they're finished. And you'll notice in a lot of his films, life is dangerous. There's a lot of um, attraction, repulsion, a lot of frustration. All of your expectations are shattered. Characters will stop the action completely and sort of walk out of character and talk to the audience. I'm fed up with that sissy stuff. It's the same old story over and over. There really was no story. Basically, it was a bunch of gags that he layered together. In fact, he once said, give me an opening, a closing, and 30 gags, and I'll make you a cartoon. I mean, you know when you're watching a Tex Avery film. And he would take these fairy tales that everybody knew and just give them a twist. Wing ship Cinderella. Well, I'll be. And then, of course, you come to the mask. The mask is in that Tex Avery tradition. <laughs> The film is set up for these wonderful tour de force Avery moments. <laughs> Ipkiss, as the masked character, can whirl himself around like the Tasmanian devil. And they're just quicksilver. He can stretch his legs out. And that's exactly what Tex Avery did in a number of his films. Then there is all of that Avery-esque bulging eyes. The Iuga face is that Tex Avery moment when your face kind of explodes. The eyeballs can spin out. The mouth opening and the tongue sort of coming out. <laughs> and then it becomes unmistakably Tex Avery when he's in the nightclub. I mean, he actually becomes that wolf character. The Tex Avery cartoon in particular that I remembered was Red Hot Riding Hood. What I really remember about Red Hot Riding Hood was the girl and the wolf and this kind of primal thing. I mean, it was the wolf whistling at the girl and the eyes bulging out. And then right away, because Stanley is so repressed, that seemed like a wonderful inspiration for some of the visuals. 
The thing about the whole Red and Wolfie series is never before and never again will we probably see such a brilliant marriage of sex and violence being so incredibly funny. Most of us here at ILM, and certainly those of us interested in animation, are great fans of the Tex Avery. So when The Mask came in, we pulled out all of our videotape references and, you know, just started to really analyze it. We'd start every round of dailies with a cartoon. The whole concept was very new of digitally animated characters interacting in the real world. There had been pictures in the past, films in the past, that combined cartoon animation with live action, but they were dealing with strictly two-dimensional animation, whereas this, we have to have a three-dimensional character. Up till this point, it was pretty difficult to do and was almost unheard of. That's a spicy meatball. Traditionally, up to that point, the pursuit of Digital animation was the pursuit of hyper-realism. And the mask was going in an entirely different direction. It's like, what would happen if we tried to do this completely crazy, out-of-bounds cartoony stuff? You know, exaggerate things, stretch them, pull them, yank them, abuse them. What would happen then? What would it look like? So one of the first things that we did is have Jim come up and we did a photo shoot with him. And then our art department went in and started manipulating his face just so that we could get an idea for how far we could take it and what that might look like. And Steve Williams, known as Spaz at uh, Industrial Light and Magic, was my cohort and his team had the right sensibility uh, at ILM. And then as a visual effects supervisor, I would also go to the sets and the locations and supervise that. He actually took my hand and explained to me sort of how it worked. It was actually a challenge for the crew whenever we would do these things, especially when the mask spun. A lot of things were knocked over, there was wind, and you know, it was more about choreographing the interactive reality of things that would happen in in a set or in a scene and time them well and then like put Jim in and let him finish it, you know? So you actually have nothing at that point. You know, you, you have nothing. You're shooting just the background, completely speculating what you're going to do with animation later. That was one of the first shots we did where we just kind of took a little step off into the unknown and, and uh, blocked something that didn't exist at all. For the bouncing, we used essentially a footage of him just standing there, and we'd stretch it out and shorten it as we bounced off the different walls. And we had the practical effects people who do all of the different explosions and breaking elements and things, so we had them rig it for a specific timing. That's a problem in any effects film, trying to work out both the eye line, the pacing, the timing of the action, both practical effects and for the actors. Uh, and how they had to react, even in scenes like where Jim Carrey turns into the wolf and mimicking the Tex Avery. We worked closely with Jim on what that action would be and how he might mind that motion going on. So when he does the whistles, he has to pretend that his mouth is this long. You see Jim imagine for me that he's extending his face into a wolf. That footage is pretty funny all by itself. It's a, it becomes a jigsaw puzzle of a live action, in camera work complemented by CGI work. A good example of the combination of effects is when Jim jumps out the window and, uh, and gets flattened in the great Tex Avery style. That particular jump was one of the first times we used something called a descender rig. I put Jim on that rig to get the tonsil shot and pulled him away from camera. So I get the lens right in his mouth and put the little tonsil <laughs> in CGI inside. And then the next thing we see him fall onto the pavement. Look, Ma, I'm roadkill. <laughs> and at that point, then we go into computer graphics where we shape him down and flatten it out and bend it up and animated it. And my favorite, I, of course, was when the, uh, the dog puts the, the mask on. I think it was something that nobody actually expected. And so when it happened, it was a big surprise and a big laugh. 
When Milo puts his head into the mask, I mean, that was another thing that trainers had to do some special training to get him to, to do that action. I remember Chuck Russell saying, he doesn't have to stick his head all the way in the mask. We can bring the mask up to him. Because I thought I was gonna have to do kind of a, re a reverse optical effect. I knew how I could start with the dog's face down and roll camera, and he naturally would take his face out and I would reverse the film. And I thought, oh, man, I'm gonna stick his head in the mask. And, and the main reason was is because I think then it made him a thinking character. For him to do that deliberately meant that he knew the way out of this situation was to stick his head in there. Which is what Max did. Max did it. And then we basically replaced Milo's head in all those shots. The dog, to begin with, was an amazing actor, the way he was able to hit his marks, but every now and then he needed help. We had to hang a little inner tube off the back of the pants to allow for the space we had to have, because when his head grew, it was so huge that we had to allow for that space in the shooting. And then later, when Jim pulls off the mask off Milo, we have to tell Jim, okay, you need to grab it back here because that's how big his head's going to be, and you have to hold the dog further back. And Jim has to pretend that the dog's licking his face and has to hold him back here. Jim's performance was so expressive. You know, you knew exactly what timings you had to fit in the animation. Oh, easy, boy. <laughs> Jim Carrey's the perfect person for this film. His movements are cartoon-like to go back before you go forward or to go down before you go up and then he, he's off in like two frames jim was amazing that way really got the concept and really worked well under those sort of parameters that the visual effects people put on him fortunately for me jim has such an active imagination that he could really visualize most of that stuff and and really make it part of his performance Visual effects have now become their own star, and really The Mask was one of the first films to really do that. And since then, ye gods! Thank you very much. If we were to do The Mask again today, it would be a, a much simpler process, you know, relative, although I'm sure they'd want to do something even further than what they had. Yeah. Freeze! I think the free adaptation of some of the Tex Avery effects was successful because they were very good when Tex Avery did it and they were very good when Chuck Russell did it. Tex Avery's legacy remains and I think his influence has been pervasive and it'll go on. Frustration is timeless, paranoia is timeless, anger is timeless, and making us see ourselves in them but laughing at ourselves at the same time. You look at those films and they're sparkling and funny, always funny, and I think that's, that's the main thing. They'll always make us laugh. I finally got rid of that wolf. Oh, yeah? That's what you think, sister. Dog. I try to make it fun. I try to make it positive. They want to learn. Sit. 
Good boy. You make sure you let him know exactly what he did right. Good boy. Good boy. We're there for the safety of our animals. Now that hurt the both of us. And the director says, I got to have that dog. No, no, no. We've had directors say to us, the dog is hitting the mark better than the actors. <laughs> There's usually a set of standards that each trainer holds for themselves. Yeah. All of our dogs can sit and lie head down, down and head down and head up on your side, straighten up. There's a list that we call basics, which would be definitely more than what you'd call basics if you're an average dog at home. On your feet, back up, back up. When you're training a dog, you've got basics that you're going to train the dog that every dog should know. You know, come and stay and sit and retrieve and go with someone. The way I begin to teach a dog is the same way that you raise a kid. I try to motivate. It's like the teacher that you had in school, the ones you learned the most from, they motivated you and you wanted to learn. It was fun. Good boy, that's good. Every dog has its own personality. No, no, you can't quit. No, you can't quit. Anyone who thinks that they can train a dog with one set of rules is mistaken. Every dog's personality dictates how you will train that dog. Some dogs are very shy, and so they need a different approach on them. They need a gentler, softer spoken voice. Some dogs are very hyper and, and high energy, and you need to stay calm to keep them calm. All right. So every personality dictates how long it'll take to train the dog. Toby, straighten up, stay. Basically for the first uh, six, eight months, you wanna learn their personality, as I always say, let them be a puppy, and then you wanna start the training. The techniques I use, I use all positive reinforcement in my training. You never wanna have a heavy hand. Good boy. I recommend positive reinforcement. Things that are fun for the dog, that you're encouraging the dog in a positive way with a positive attitude. Um, Teaching him to sit up and then rewarding them in the position that I like them in. You gotta have uh, control with them, so you wanna train them on what's called a mark. On a mark. Mark, on a mark. The dog has to go to an exact point and stay. Good boy, stay. Speaks is a big thing. They always gotta have a speak. Speak. Cool. You can get one trained within six, eight months, or it could take uh, three to four years. It depends on the dog. Stay. The bigger the appetite for the dog, the better it is to train. Or you gotta have something that they're focused on, like a ball or a toy. And you make sure you always give positive reinforcement. Sometimes you want to pay them two and three times if they've done a long take. The first thing I try to do is get the script. Because a lot of times there's gags in there that are written for a small dog, but they're asking for a large dog. And that's the type of thing they don't understand. You try to make sure you don't pick a really laid back type of a dog that has no energy when you have a high energy show. Eventually you get a pick of a few that you think would really fit for this and you try to sell those on the project. A director, when he looks for a dog in a casting call, he looks for sometimes just characteristics. Sometimes my best trained dog won't get the part because the director will look for a specific feature such as big droopy ears. They want maybe a comedy movie, calls for bigger jowls, maybe the way the dog walks. He's got a goofy walk. Generally, they pick from the look, um, more so than <laughs> what they're trained to do, and then we'll train it. Sometimes there's castings. We'll take the dogs down to castings, even callbacks, and the, the dogs actually have to audition. You show up with your dog, and they'll have a room and with the director, whoever's casting the dogs, and you'll go in and show them what they're, they're asking to see, whether it's personality, whether it's behavior, it's calmness, energy. Dogs. They don't exactly have headshots, but they have the form of a headshot. It's a full body shot, usually on all fours. You wanna see the physique of the dog. You wanna see uh, basically how his, uh, his front looks. So you wanna get like an angle that you kinda of, uh, use your imagination with all sides. There are some similarities between acting dogs and actual human actors. They work like actors work on a set and a dog will walk in and hit a mark just like an actor would. A lot of times in films, you don't realize it, but dogs have doubles. Features, you tend to want to double for your dog to do the running, where one dog might do the running and the other dog might do the real intricate. Being with an actor, your other dog's sort of your stunt dog, does the swimming, the running, the jumping, the high energy stuff. It's a lot of 12 hour days, five, six days a week. It's very common to have a double so that you save the energy of both of your dogs. It's hard when you come to uh, like Jack Russell's and Basset Hounds because they have spots so you actually have to bring them to a makeup artist and they'll actually dye the spots the exact way as far as dogs working on set, or any animal at that, we gotta make sure there's obviously no people feeding the dog on set. You'd be amazed how many people, they come with their pockets full of treats. Next thing you know, when I call the dog on set, the dog's more focused on the guy that gave him the uh, little biscuit. Our dogs don't have any uh, contracts. 
or any uh, set amount of hours. We play it by what we know the dog can pull off and, and what he can't. They have an hourglass, just like we all do. We have to rest, we have to take breaks, we have to go eat, drink water, and the dogs, they have the same exact needs. I hear that. We can't work them to death. Like a lot of times, uh, especially in the past, they've been worked so hard where the dog basically, he'll just collapse. And we can't do that. We have to make the set a fun place for a dog. Otherwise, yeah. you're gonna have a real hard time on set. The dog's gonna, never gonna wanna go on set again. The dog's always provided with a place to stay. But depending upon the budget of the show that you're on, the amount of hype that the animal has received, they will from time to time have a trailer for the animal or a dressing room. A good day or a great day on the set is when you have trained and you get to the set and you go in there and you just do it. You, two takes and you're done. Good boy. When people give you the comments that the dog made up for lost time, Sit. that's pretty amazing and, and that's a good day at set. You're so good, aren't you? A bad day on set is if you were to get there after prepping and your animal not do a single thing you were asking and just going downhill, shot after shot, not being able to fulfill what the director wants from you, that would be a very bad day on set. Did you just talk? No. And some of the, the different projects that I did, on Man's Best Friend, I was brought in by Clint Rowe, the head trainer on that show, to do some of the supporting uh, animal actors. For instance, I did a, an orange cat that the dog chases, goes up a tree and eats the cat. Female collie. A little Jack Russell we did in, in, in there also. Take him to the hole, Nikki. I mean, woof, woof. In Little Nicky, the dog that we used, his name was Harvey. He was an English bulldog. Now get off the track and come with me. One of the hardest things about that film going into it is that the dog had to keep his mouth closed because he was going to be a talking character. And now what they do is they computer generate the mouth movement. I don't know. This is a little out of my league. If you know bulldogs, keeping their mouth closed and not panning, that's one of the major dilemmas. Tough shots working uh, in Grand Central Station in New York with people all over the place, working on the streets of New York. Sidewalk equals safety, middle of the road equals death. Unlike LA and different places where you shut down a street when you're working, they don't shut these streets down in New York. It just keeps going and you're just working alongside the streets. We've been ratted out. It was challenging for a little bulldog. Roy, come on. The dog in the hidden was Jake. He went in and auditioned against a lot of other dogs, and he just got the role because he was a good snarler, and he was a good working dog. One of the toughest shots in the hidden that Jake had to do was he had to run and jump through this French slatted uh, window, and he jumped through that. That was a tough shot. It wasn't like jumping through a candy glass window. It was actually a blind jump. In the mask, Max uh, was the dog that played Milo. He really hadn't done anything of any significance up to that point. His training was all right. He had his basics, but really he needed quite a bit of work for that film. And as you saw, it, it just really worked out well. And one of the reasons is Jim Carrey had a Jack Russell at home. Get him! Find him! He was fabulous with the dog. And that makes a big difference. When an actor is into the dog and relates well with the dog, it really helps your job. You know, you're not supposed to jump up. It's against doggy ordinance. I'll tell you, one of the hardest things to train this dog was him catching the frisbee. And people go, well, that's an easy shot. This dog couldn't catch. He just was a bad catch. I mean, you'd toss him the frisbee, he'd maybe catch it one out of 10. Get it! We did about 10 takes, and he finally caught one. And that set up the gag later for him jumping up and getting the mask. So it was an important piece, but he was not good at it. Wait, that dog. Training city animals is a great amount of fun because you have the ability to say, I want my dog to do this and behave this way, and you can do that. It's a game of chess. This isn't checkers. You have to learn their next move in order to stay one step ahead of the training. Drop it. If you don't know the personality, they're not going to be a very well-trained dog. 